Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and I'm joined today by Colin Watt. Colin, welcome to a State of Mind Studios. Thanks for having us again, Paul. Delighted to be here. This is Axom's Daily Bulletin and there's plenty to talk about on a daily basis, Colin. Today, yep. it's all about striking options. Celtic have been linked to various different strikers of various different sizes, qualities <laughs> and different kinds of deals. The big one, really, the big uh, point of discussion was Stephen Fletcher. I think the news broke from his friend Tam McManus. So I would reckon that it's pretty good information mm-hmm. um, if you're looking at Tam as a source. He's a friend of Stephen Fletcher. But it seems as though the deal has cooled since yes. last night. What's the latest update on that? From what I've been told, uh, Fletcher was actually looking for a two-year contract at Celtic. Understandably, given his previous injury concerns and the fact he's coming towards the end of his career, Celtic had only offered him a one-year deal, and it looks as if that, that is now off the table. To be honest with you, I'm not sure whether Fletcher was ever going to be the, the main choice. I wonder if he's been a pawn being used for other transfers that's kind of ongoing out there. Enough to kind of say to other chairman, well... Maybe Celtic are moving on, I need to throw my guy out there. A guy that's maybe quite outlandish, like Barry Fry, would maybe see that Celtic are looking to look at other options and going, maybe the ball's not in our court the way I thought it was. So people are just using the medium of social media to their own advantage. It's never happened before, has it? Well, it's interesting now because it never used to be a thing, but obviously you can put that word out to a friend like Tam McManus, and of course, before you know it, it's all over Twitter. Well, there's always plenty to discuss with Celtic. Were you up at midnight last night trying to buy some Adidas kit? I wasn't up at midnight, no, but I did hear that the queues were biblical, is the quotes that I've heard. Um, Was that Liam Gallagher's tweet? Well, I'll only follow no. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding Don't want to get kicked out of the studios No but from what I'd heard They were turning fans away about 1 o'clock this morning Because the queues had already reached a certain level And obviously they've got to close for reopening in the morning I was actually at the airport store at 4am I spent more money than I anticipated spending But I do look as if I've just came out the Adidas summer winter collection And I've got to say the, the quality of the goods is, is top notch And... Unlike some other teams, I don't think the the posties will be stabbing the parcels. So <laughs> I just look forward to it. Allegedly, Colin. Now, you mentioned there, without prompt, that you only followed No. Are you in Team No? No, I was just winding you up. Are you an Oasis fan? I wouldn't say I'm an, a massive Oasis fan. I'd say I enjoy their music, but I'm not one of those super fans of it like yourself. But I, I would look forward to the, the reunion, should would it ever come excellent. about. So we're looking at Ivan Tony of Peterborough. You mm-hmm. mentioned Barry Fry before. Prolific at Peterborough. Mm-hmm. What kind of fee are we looking at there, Colin? Uh, I'm led to believe that Brentford had made a bid of around £5 million, pounds plus add-ons should they make the Premier League. Obviously, we've seen the other day that they, they failed in the, the Championship playoff final. In fact, if anyone hasn't seen that yet, I recommend going back and looking at Fulham's first goal Whatever the goalkeeper was doing for that goal will be in every blooper video highlight reel going forward. He dives after the balls in the back of the net. It's incredible. But moving, going back to Brentford, they've got a fantastic front three. Their front three was absolutely prolific in the championship. It was one of the reasons that they were up at the top of the table. So unless someone's going to be moving on, I don't see where Tony fits in there. Now, from the understanding that I have is that Tony prefers a move to Scotland. He wants to give a go in Europe. He sees it as a platform for him to make a move into the Premiership eventually. But we've had this dealing with Fry before, where I believe that we were after Lee Tomlin, and the co- the conversations between him and Peter Lawwell basically became public, and Celtic walked away from the deal. This could be happening again, but if Celtic are really in the market for a striker, given the options that's out there between Ivan Tony, Albina Jetty, and p- potentially Stephen Fletcher, um, Tony at twenty three probably is the one that you're looking at to say he's got the potential down the line for us to do what we do best buy in, develop and sell on for a fee We'll have a a wee chat Colin about the other two names that are in the frame at the moment but we'll also look at some of the other areas because everybody's focusing on the striker area Mm. Uh, at the moment I I reckon that uh, we would require a central defender before we bought a striker Definitely, I mean I think we're very weak I, I commented on um, the last bulletin that we done with yourself and Jim saying that we really do need another another defender because if it wasn't for uh, sorry, if it was for the fact that we get an injury to Ayer or to Julian then 
suddenly were struggling. I mean, who's going to come in near Beaton playing centre half? I, I rate him, but he is prone to those mistakes and he isn't a natural centre back. You're not going to get a partnership built up with him. Stephen Welsh is still a young player, was on loan at Morton last season, came in and played well in the, the game against Hamilton, looked okay in pre season, but that's a lot of responsibility to put on mm. someone, especially when we're looking to qualify for the Champions League. It's probably one of the, the best chances we've got of qualifying for the Champions League because it's not two leg games. We've got one off games and in 90 minutes anything can happen. Well, see when you, you consider that the speculation that, that's coming out in relation to the strikers is one thing. You've mentioned a young guy there, a young kid who came in and did well mm. uh, as a youngster after a very good uh, loan spell uh, in Greenock, which isn't far from where you live, Colin. But uh, really, if you're going for 10 in a row, you can't really risk no. this, you know. Uh, and we've spoken before, Colin, about buying in players of a certain quality and a certain ilk. And what you get is you get Julian, you get Eduard. Mm-hmm. And that's the type of level that we're looking at. And I think that's maybe when I'm looking at the striker options and we've already spoken about Tony, who you think would be the one for you. Albiana Jetty, for example, is coming in very highly rated, massive move to West Ham, hasn't worked out. And as I've said on the podcast before, it reminds me a wee bit of where El Yunusi was when mm-hmm. we went in and got him in on loan. I think, you know, it's a try before you buy with a Jetty, is it not? Is that, you know, that's low risk? It is low risk, especially when you look at some of the other try before you buys that we had before. I know there was fans screaming out for the boy from... Borussia Dortmund, the right back Toyan mm. to sign permanently instead of signing on a loan deal and I think we can all agree that by the time that loan deal was done we were very happy to send him back to where he, not where he came from but I think they signed him for Dortmund. about 7 million euros didn't they? He, he, he moved and he's actually had a decent career but it just wasn't for Scottish football mm-hmm. and it's the same with um, the loan signing from Stoke last season, Maurice Bauer there was, a, there was talk of him then going on to become a permanent signing if the, the loan spell had went well but it, for some people it just doesn't work in Scottish football it's not to say that they're a bad player um, we, we've looked at this in various articles on the website as well there's players that are suited for Scottish football and players that aren't you look at Timo Puki who's went on and had a great career outside of Scottish football but just didn't have the ability to cut it here We've already spoken about Fletcher. We know the story was broken by Tam McManus. But obviously there's been another story today broken by PLZ and Tam's one of the pundits on there. So you you would basically gauge the progress of that deal through the information that's coming via maybe Tam or or the platform that he's part of. Mm -hmm. I think the way I was looking at it, and I've seen this commented from time to time, we're not buying Fletcher to replace Eduard. We're not buying Fletcher even to replace Clamalla. You know, we're looking to try and ship out Bio. Mm-hmm. And if Fletcher is what I would regard the fourth choice, then that's fine. So I wouldn't get too excited either way if he came in or not. Obviously, we're looking at a cut in his wages and we've offered him a one-year deal. You've got to offer a 33-year-old a one-year deal, Colin. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't go for it, I won't lose any sleep. If he was to sign for Celtic as a fourth choice, someone to uh, mix it up when necessary, I'd be pretty happy with that. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. And I mean, you look at the guys that have let go this summer, guys like Johnny Hayes, who, were, who ended up moving up to Aberdeen and signing a multi-year deal. We weren't going to offer him a multi-year deal at Celtic because he was getting to that age. Mm-hmm. Now, you can't then say for Stephen Fletcher it's one rule for him and it's another rule for the likes of Johnny Hayes and Craig Gordon. If that is Celtic's transfer strategy, then that's what they've got to stick with. So if Fletcher's not happy with signing a one-year deal, then that's that's up to him. If he thinks he can get a two-year deal down south, that, that's all for him. He bought a house in Glasgow. He had the idea of moving up to to. Scottish football and to play for Celtic if it doesn't come about then it's his decision at the end of the day so as you said I wouldn't lose sleep over it I would rather Celtic looked at maybe trying to do what they did with Edward look at bringing in a young player a player with talent on a loan deal with the potential to buy him on maybe that's what a jetty is with the loan to the option of buying them. and if that's the case if it doesn't work out we're back in the same situation next year that's fine you made a comment previously in relation to Edward. Uh, there's also the question, of course, of Lee Griffiths because he was missing from the first game of the season, the opening day yep. victory against Hamilton, which Jim and I spoke about the other day. So Edward, 
He's a must keep. Everybody would agree with that. Everybody yep. tuning in. He's a must keep, regardless of whatever else comes in or whoever else comes in. You've got to keep Orson Edward. A point that was made the other day, though, Colin, was we're focusing on the striker because mm. he's the guy, he's the top class talent that uh, you know you would expect English clubs to be looking at. But Ryan Christie and Callum McGregor are massively pivotal to Celtic success, particularly McGregor. But, I mean, Christie was coming into a great game last season as well. With regards to Edward, if he was out for any reason of that Celtic team, when you've got the kind of service you're getting from the likes of McGregor and Christie, not only those two, but also the two fullbacks, judging by the weekend's game, any striker up there is going to be getting half a dozen chances oh, yeah. every week. Yep. All right? So, if Edward was to go... And it's for one of these figures, according to Charlie Nicholas, 30 million. Harold Bratback says 40 million. Then you need to go out and buy like for like. And what I mean is the Edward that we purchased for £9 million. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't really be looking at either people at the end of their career or bargain basement, if you like, because, I mean, they're not of the top division. But I think if you look at Ajeti, he has a potential to be a top, top striker. Well, definitely. And the fact that he's played with Elianusi as well, um, suggest that there could be a partnership there going forward. I mean, you look at the way that Elianusi linked up with Edward when he was fit last season. There was a lot of great interplay when you look at the um, the games in Europe. They linked up really well. Elianusi was outstanding, as I've said multiple times, in that game against Lazio um, in Rome. Were you at that game? Oh, I, I don't know if I told you, but I was definitely at that game. may have been the best day of my life. I hope my girlfriend's not watching. But honestly... I think what you said there is spot on. The service that comes to the striker will make whether the striker's a success or not. I mean, we played Lewis Morgan up front against Wren and he looked capable of playing at that level because of the service that yeah. was provided to him. We caught Fennel. Exactly. It doesn't seem that long ago, but Lewis Morgan was our centre forward that day. So when you look at it, if it was to be Stephen Fletcher, it's certainly an upgrade on having to play Lewis Morgan up front. A 2 nothing defeat for Mark McKenzie last night and he didn't have the best game at left centre-back. Is that a player that you've been following, Colin? Mark McKenzie, obviously the, the American defender that we spoke about. Before that, he was actually in the team of the week for a couple of weeks Yeah, um, within the MLS. So, I mean, everybody's entitled to have a bad game now and again. There's people that, when they know they're being watched, now that I've, from what I believe there is a scout out in America for Celtic, um, there's certainly been different players within the MLS linked to the club. Mm -hmm. It can be that when that pressure's on, that they just sort of it like gets to the head. Ah, oh, it's bound to. So, I mean, I, we can judge a player on one game, um, or we can judge him on a full season. I would hold out reservations on McKenzie until we see a bit more of him. And to be honest, is he going to be somebody that we sign? Who knows? We certainly do need to strengthen it, would you agree, Colin? Oh, definitely, definitely. Now, Kevin Graham, who has appeared on a Celtic State of Mind regularly since its inception three years ago, is asking if we are interested in two of these three, the three that we've been yep. talking about for the last 15 minutes, then it means two of the current four are leaving. Well, who would the two of the current four be is a question, I think. Firstly... I'm hearing no arguments about Bio getting loaned out or even shipped out. <laughs> now, no disrespect to the big fella, right? He became a bit of a cult. Yep. Every time he ran on the field as a sub, it was the Amido Baldo thing. Everybody was cheering him. Yep. I don't think he's got it, Colin. No, and I th do you know what? There's, as I said before, there's certain players that move to Scotland and they're just ready for the game. They're ready to make that transition. Bio, by all accounts, had a great season before he moved over. Mm. The team that he left were so gutted that he was leaving. He stayed for a couple of days to do signings and things like that. So there, there obviously there's a player in there. Is it's there a buyback clause? Oh, who's who knows? Hopefully. As I say, though, it's not going to happen for him. So no. if, he, if he leaves, we wish him all the very best. But we need to push forward in relation to improving that squad. Yep. Should you have a couple of suspensions and injuries and you're going into a big game, you don't want to be in a situation where you're playing a Lewis Morgan no. centre-forward in a League Cup final. So I think that's where we're coming from there. And it's a good point from Kevin. The other question would be who else then? Who would be the second striker that would be shipping out? I mean, obviously there's been loads of speculation around odds on Edward. Top, top quality. You're talking a huge amount of money should he go. What's the situation currently with Lee Griffiths? Well, see, that that's my opinion. My opinion is you're looking at Lee Griffiths now. I think Lee Griffiths as a footballer on the park 
is a fantastic asset to Celtic. But over the mo- over the last sort of two or three years, has he been the most reliable? Now, we're getting into a situation here where we must win this title this year. It's unthinkable for Celtic not to win the title. If you're needing goals, you've got nine subs on the bench. Mm-hmm. I don't mind the three of them are strikers. So if you're even playing two up front to have five strikers, if you can keep them all happy and give them 10, 15 minutes here and there, the likes of a jetty has played out in the wing before. We definitely need options on the wing. Well, you mentioned not... Johnny Hayes. You know, him leaving means that we are short on the left. Oh, definitely. And on the right, who have you got? At the minute, playing, we have Elia and Usain, we have Forrest. Yes. Mikey Johnson's out for six weeks. Mm-hmm. The other option at the minute is Karamoko Dembele, who I think has got a great future in front of him, but he's 17. It's a lot of pressure to put on someone. Why are we not asking where the options are coming from out wide? No, you're right. The other option on the right, of course, is Frimpong, who played out there last season, Mm -hmm. very briefly, uh, with El Hamid perhaps behind him or as part of a a 3-5 formation. So, yeah, I don't think you would bring in Stephen Fletcher as a replacement for Edward. We're talking two completely different styles for a kickoff, but different standards, different levels of player. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, don't get me wrong, if you look at someone who's scored... I think he scored 16 goals in the championship last season, mm-hmm. Stephen Fletcher. Now, if you if I was to turn around to you and say, well, how much would you pay for a championship striker that scored 16 goals? Immediately, you'd be thinking seven, eight figures. But it's Stephen Fletcher. So is, how does that look upon it? Do you know what I mean? Is it the name or is it the fact that the he age. scored the goals? I honestly think it's the age that, that's the factor in people. And the fact that we're looking back to what happened back in 2009. Mm. and um, Stephen Fletcher has said uh, recently he wanted to sign. It was out of his control. Yep. He wanted to sign for Celtic. But as I say, certainly not as a first choice. Jed Sweeney, welcome back. We spoke to you during the weekend's game against Hamilton, and Jed Sweeney says, let's be honest, none of them are coming. Lowell, it is old tricks. We will get the wee Man City guy. What's your thoughts on that? Are we, th- are we playing Russian roulette here? So I'd, I'd seen the link with the the sort of boy from Man City this morning. Um, By all accounts, he was at Middlesbrough for the latter half of last season, playing alongside a a hero of mine in uh, Paddy Roberts. But he was playing out in the wing. The boy's not a striker. Mm -hmm. He's one of those sort of forward three. If I had to describe him as a player within the the Scottish Premier League to compare him to, it's a bit like Yanis Hadji, where they like to play him as a false nine, play him as a winger. Mm -hmm. But... We've got that relationship, obviously, with Manchester City. Um, it's well documented where, where the relationship comes from. I wouldn't be surprised if it's not him, then we will end up with a loanee from Manchester City this summer. You mentioned we Paddy. We were all very fond of Paddy Roberts uh, when he came twice, actually, up to Celtic Park. Where is he these days? Well, now that the championship season's over, he's back to Man City. Back to the parent club. Um, I know he'd signed a new two-year contract, so I believe he's still got a year left on his deal. Mm-hmm. That boy needs games, Colin. It's a he wasted games. talent. It's a complete yeah, wasted talent. When you look at what Man City paid Fulham for, Paddy... It's a drop in the ocean for Man City, though, really, isn't it? But when you go out and spend that sort of money, you're expecting some sort of return on him. Now, yeah. he's, what, 23, 24 years old? They're mm-hmm. going to have to eventually cut their losses. And if Celtic's not sniffing around, then I would be quite disappointed. Could you utilise somebody like that down both flanks. Oh, definitely. Paddy's... Would uh, be a good option? And people say, get over him, you know, it's happened and he's had his chance. At this moment in time, to cover both left and right-hand side, I think it's still an option. I think if Paddy's genuinely looking at his career... Now, I don't know who else would be interested in him. I don't think there's a move... A few to, failed loan deals, Yeah, to I be don't fair. think there's going to be a move to the Premier League for him. His move to Norwich didn't materialise and we've seen how Norwich finished the season. Mm-hmm. Does he want to move down to the Championship? Or if the offers to come back to Glasgow, he's he's proven up here that he can play at a top level. That game against Manchester City at the Etihad, he was unplayable. Yes. Follower Celtic, should we keep bit part players? Encham and Rogic. Well, I think that's it's, a, it's a good question. It's a good question though, because I mean, Tommy Rogic, we're playing Kilmarnock this weekend. Yep. One of the players I think of in recent times is Tommy Rogic, for obvious reasons. I I have mentioned over the the last few months on the podcast, he has been fairly ineffective since Neil Lennon came back in. Definitely. What do you do with a guy like Tom Rogic? I mean, Tom Rogic has the ability, sorry, to be a game changer. He is that person that can play the ball that no one else can see. You try and get the ball off Tom Rogic as well on his day, 
and it's absolutely impossible. I think Kevin Graham um, actually described it once as trying to get... Uh, sorry, Roger would be able to keep a beach ball off someone in a telephone box. He's that good with close control. The, the bit I take about Umbridge too here is Encham being a bit part player. Now, I was actually quite annoyed with the fact that Encham was in the reserve sort of side through pre- pre-season. Mm-hmm. I think Encham is one of the best central midfielders that Celtic have got. Agreed. And if you're looking at trying to phase out Scott Brown this season, Encham, to me, is the natural selection. Mm-hmm. He can play deep, he can play forward, he's good cover, and if I was him, I'd be knocking down Lennon's door expecting to get my starts. He's one of the guys, as you say, you know, if you were to sign a player like him from Man City this pre-season mm-hmm. for five or six million, you'd be pretty chuffed with that. Oh, definitely. Encham, should he stay? Should he go? Should we be playing him far more often than we have been? I mean, the, on his day, which is uh, obviously the important part, he is the finest technician in the Scottish League. Loves a, a, a game against Rangers as well. We opened up the new season against Hamilton. It's mm. 5-1. You might think, well, why change it? Don't fix something that isn't broken. What would your lineup be this Sunday? Would you make any changes, Colin? I think Barkas will probably come in for a debut. Right. As you say, I've said on this platform before, I think Scott Bain is a good goalkeeper, but when you spend that sort of money on um, a goalkeeper, you're probably going to have to play him as your number one. Um, so I would expect Barkas to come in. Looking at the sort of back four, I don't think that will change. I think Greg Taylor was absolutely outstanding at the weekend and I look forward to seeing what he can do. He's obviously played at Kilmarnock before so he knows the ground, he knows how to play it. <laughs> the, the, the concern really comes up with the plastic pitch mm-hmm. and I, I don't want to make this out to be a leveller because it's not, it's not a leveller but the ball does bounce in a different way. Players react differently on the plastic pitch because of previous injuries because of um, the way that their studs go into the ground. So looking at the 11 that started against Hamilton, I don't think there's any concern really of players that would potentially get injured, but guys that are injury prone, like El Hamid, mm-hmm. I can't see him playing purely and simply because at the start of the season you want to try and keep as many players fit as possible. Well, on that note, because we're talking about the forthcoming Kilmarnock game and the Celtic State of Mind will be covering the entire match live. We'll be coming on live streaming 30 minutes before kickoff, and we'll stay with you throughout the entire game. You can get involved, ask your questions, make your comments and we'll stay with you right through until quarter to seven at night. What's your prediction for Kilmarnock on Sunday, Colin? I think certainly having looked at Kilmarnock in their game uh, the the weekend there against Hibs, I certainly think they've they've still got a bit to go in the transfer market um, to get to where the the stage that they probably want to be. I think Kilmarnock see themselves now as a top six club um, ever since the Stevie Clark days. I don't quite think they're there yet, and I think that this should be another comfortable victory for Celtic. If we get going early doors, it could be another four or five. But if they become difficult to break down. Who knows, maybe 2-1, 3-1. But I'm, I'm thinking positive. I'm going to go with a 4-0 Celtic victory. And first goal scorer, El Yunusi. So 4 nothing El Yunusi. There's a prediction from a Celtic state of mind. Join us at the weekend. Get involved. Colin will be with us. He's one of the pundits on Sunday, as will Kevin Graham and David Slight. If you want to get involved, DM me and we'll see what we can do. We are based in Dalkeith at Estate of Mind Studios. And if you want to sponsor this show or any of the Axom shows in the future, get in touch because there are some opportunities for that as well. Jed Sweeney, if we want Tony, just go and get him. I think that comes down to Barry Fry being one of these wily old managers who's a wheeler and a dealer and he'll be trying to hold Celtic to ransom con. I think it also comes down to the fact that the transfer window doesn't close until... October and if Peter Lawwell can kind of etch out a deal for as long as possible to get the best possible deal for the club that's exactly what we'll do The point has already been uh, kind of raised and covered by yourself should we play Bain or Barkas thanks for the question Vice Point Studio Colin's already said Barkas I think if you're Bain you would be feeling a wee bit disappointed at that mm. and then you look at the goalkeeper jersey for this season being short sleeved and that might cheer him up Well that is his favourite I know that when it was the long sleeve jersey, he had a, a habit of cutting it and cutting the sleeve because it was short. Goalkeepers, they're, they're a unique character. Eccentric um, at times. Exactly. You'll not remember Campos, while you're from the, the Mexican from the World Cup. 
You used to have the loud strips. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you had Bruce Grobler, the, the clown prince of soccer, uh, amongst other things. Mikey Posters is asking, if there was a player in the SPFL you guys would love to see signing for Celtic, who would it be? I mentioned it the other day, Martin Boyle. Martin Boyle at Hibs, I think, would be a fantastic addition to Celtic's side. Coming off the left, he is probably the quickest player in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. He's got that international experience, having played for Australia. He's got the experience of playing in the league. He knows what it's all about. And when we're looking at someone like Elia Nussi being our only option on the left-hand side, um, having a Martin Boyle to come off the bench after 60 minutes, it just stretches that defence even further and when you're going to try and maybe get a last minute goal uh, or you're trying to extend your lead um, can you imagine the, the look on defenders faces when they come on and see Martin Boyles up against them yeah I, I do rate the guy I think uh, he would be a handy player he would obviously be a squad player and hopefully you could develop him um, I would like to see Dykes on the back of a Celtic strip but I wouldn't sign Lyndon Dykes for that um, <laughs> satisfaction the other guy again is Lewis Ferguson who's been mentioned and I think he's very promising would I sign him? yes I would how much would it cost? two and a half? two the, million? Th this is the, the problem though so Lewis Ferguson central midfielder central attacking midfielder we are really strong in that area. Would he make more of an impact? And this goes back to one of the questions we had before than Tom Rogic has made in the last 18 months. Different types of players, but same area of the field. Would he make more of an impact? <sighs> to be fair, I haven't seen a lot of Ferguson. What I seen of him last season was him getting sent off. And that seemed to happen a few times, so it looks as if the boy's got to mature a bit. But we're all forgiven players' Haven't chances. we all? Haven't we all, Colin? Well, Vice Point Studio, thanks again for your, your uh, regular comments this afternoon. Big Tam can't stay fit. We all love him, but it's a tricky one going forward. Very frustrating. I think Celtic will look at that situation as every passing season, Colin, his value is dipping dramatically. I mean, there was one point at this, this stage last season, I was talking about Rogic as a £10 million player. We wouldn't get anywhere near that if we sold him just now. No, I don't, I don't think we would. And we've always went on about Rogic and his, his injuries. It's been part and parcel of his development as a Celtic player. And then, you know, you get six months out of him where he's the best player in Scotland. And I guess at Celtic, we've just sort of accepted that's the way it is with Tom Rogic. But if you take a look at someone like James Forrest, James Forrest had underlying issues with injury for years. There was a stage where a lot of Celtic fans were happy to see James Forrest leave the club on a free transfer. Whatever happened with James Forrest, with whatever specialist that he went to, you're now coming back and looking at a guy that scored nearly 60 goals in three seasons. Mm -hmm. Could it happen for Rogic? Let's hope so. And I actually get the player that we know is in there to play a full 90 minutes for 38 games a season. Encham is a Rolls Royce. Now we've spoken about that. Agreed. We've spoken about his style. We've also spoken about describing people as cars I don't know what I would be described as Colin but he is a Rolls Royce did you see me driving that Merc the other day not mine as it happens but <laughs> I almost stalled it I'm not the best driver keep in Cham and punt Rogic McPhee Andrew or Andrew McPhee I agree with you I think it's time for Rogic to go I think we need to free up that wage and free up that space in the squad in Cham is a different level completely different level of player I would give him more games we're talking not about phasing Scott Brown out we're looking at his age and we're looking at how, you know, his experience in the changing room and the actual training pitch is so valuable that he needs to be part of the club. But I wouldn't expect him to play 50 games, Colin. No. Encham comes into the squad far more for me this season. I think Olivier Encham is, the guy's right, he's a Rolls-Royce player. And what I mean by that is, if you compare the Rolls-Royce and cars is a premium car. Olivier and Cham's a premium player. Right. He's one that if you, if you left the squad and you had to replace like for like, you would get no one anywhere near as good to come up to Scottish football. Another one for you to throw into the mix. Vice Point Studio reminds us of a player called Marianne Schwed. From what I'm led to believe, he's going to be going out on loan mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's still got two years left on his deal at Celtic. Um, but the problem he seems to have here is apparently he doesn't speak English. Right. But I mean, the, the big thing is there's a lot of players like Schwed that, that, you know, in bio is another obvious one that you need to remove from the wage bill. If, they, if they're not going to play, get them off the wage bill and then bring in someone who is going to be pushing for a first team slot. Call. I think my fear for Schwed, Schwed is that we're going to let him go to a team in Europe and then we're going to face him in two or three years in the Europa League or the Champions League and he's going to come back and bite us because there is talent there, but whether he can do it at Celtic's 
still to be seen. It's a chance I would be willing to take. Now, thank you very much, Colin, for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind. And we'll see you again soon for another episode of the Celtic State of Mind Bulletin. 